You've got questions, we've got answers. And I think that makes your pathway to university a lot easier. The brain. Oh, voice. Especially the first year if you pick cord, the right subjects uh, in year 11 and 12. Bellum, information. Here, and those uh, signals run down through the spine. Here in our studio, we'll be bringing you the answer to these questions and more. Join us for Informate. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another episode of Informate. In recent years, there has been a notable shift worldwide for a greener planet. Now, this has taken many forms from emissions regulations on cars to the prevalence of alternative energy sources to the old fossil fuels. Another form this has taken is the move for many major cities around Australia to reduce the number of cars on the road. One approach is the increased push for people to cycle. Now, whether you cycle to work or cycle for recreation, you may have seen some changes in your local areas. In order to promote a healthier lifestyle and fewer cars on the road, in 2011, the National Cycling Strategy was created with the goal to double cycling participation by 2016. The results of this survey were released in 2017 and found that over a third of the Australian population have cycled in the previous year, with just over 15% cycling regularly. This equates to just over 3.7 million Aussies riding in a typical week. Now this might seem like an excellent number, but there has been a slight decrease in riding statistics from when the survey started in 2011. Still, local governments and councils are making significant infrastructure developments to help encourage more people to take up cycling, not as a profession, but as a healthy approach to a better lifestyle for the old and young. Now in today's program, we'll be talking about some different types of cycling and bicycles in general. To help us understand this topic, we are joined here today by Fasil, Javed and Amin. Thank you very much for joining us in today's program. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Now Javed, how long have you been cycling? Well, like most kids, I started in the backyard and then in the local streets uh, doing our tricks on the trustworthy BMXs. That led to commuting to and from school and then exploring the local trails and all that sort of stuff. So it's been an adventure of nearly 35 years and so hopefully you've been the adventure. Most of your life. I have, I have. I'm pushing nearly 40, you know, so when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, but uh, the adventure continues. Excellent. So, and how have you found that your riding style differ over the years? You mentioned you started on BMXs. Are yeah. you still riding BMXs? Do we yeah, start riding? No, no, I've grown beyond that. So, I started off with BMXs and then that led, led to uh, mountain bikes. So, the mountain bike is a, you know, it's a strong, sturdy bike. It can go anywhere from the streets to the mountains, to the hills. And with a camping lifestyle also, it integrates well with that. Uh, so, I retrofitted my mountain bike to help me with road riding. So, um, Cycling is more of a hobby and part of the overall fitness program, if you like. So I retrofitted my mountain bike, you know, with tri bars, changed the uh, chain rings to give me a bit more speed. Um, so, you know, it's been an evolutionary process. Over the years, things have changed. You learn things. It's been trial and error. So what's the latest step of your evolution? Well, road riding. So I've uh, finally invested in a road bike. So I moved on from, oh, I've still got the mountain bike and we still use that when we go camping, etc. But uh, yeah, I've bought what they call a BMC road bike, uh, entry level sort of um, bicycle. But that does me, I'm not professional, I'm not with Cycling Australia or r riding the NRS uh, teams, etc. So still I'm a happy. big jump from the mountain bike to the road bike, different configurations that we'll get into later? Oh, of course, of course, Excellent. no doubt. Chalk and cheese. Brilliant. Now, I mean, how long have you been riding for? Uh, four years. Four years. And did you start off on a mountain bike as well? No, just a push bike with training wheels. With training wheels. Now, how long were you on that for? Um, two years. Two years. And what are you riding at the moment? A Noroco mountain bike. Very good. How do you like riding that? Uh, it's really nice. Uh, it's good. When you're riding, do you wear a helmet or anything? What do you wear when you're riding? Well, when I go um, camping, I wear a chest plate. I wear a helmet, of course, and I wear um, chin pad gloves and goggles. Wow, so you, you, you kitted out, you're making sure you're safe when yeah, you're riding? I don't want to stack it. Excellent. Now, Fassel, I think your story is a little bit different to the two guys who've been riding most of their lives. What's your story? Yeah, as you just said, um, I've had a little bit of a different um, uh, path in my cycling um, career, if you will. I started off cycling when I was a child, you know. Um, and I haven't really cycled since I was probably 15 or 16. It's the last time I jumped on a bike. Wow. Um, about 12 months ago, I had an injury. I injured my ankle. 
And as part of the rehabilitation and to allow me to stay physically fit, um, I decided to get back into cycling. But I didn't want to get back into just any cycling. So I looked around and saw what was different, you know, the direction that the sort of world was heading in. And um, I found uh, electric bikes and that piqued my interest. So I looked into electric bikes and I ended up actually buying myself an electric bike. Um, so and you, you had a gap of how many years between when you stopped riding and when you decided to get back into it? I'd say it was a good 20 years Wow! that I hadn't ridden a bike. Uh, and then I jumped on a bike for the first time in 20 years and it was like I'd been riding all my life. You know, it's true the old saying that once, you've, once you learn how to ride, you don't really forget. Yeah. Now you mentioned an electric bike. Is, is that a little bit different to the mountain bikes that we've been hearing about? Um, electric bikes can come in all different formats. So there are electric bikes which are road bikes. Uh, there are electric bikes which are mountain bikes. Absolutely. The one I'm currently riding is an electric mountain bike, yes. Um, so is, is it what you think when you hear electric bike, the old throttle style bike, you, like a motorcycle? Yeah, yeah. That's interesting you ask that because many people ask me the same question when, whenever they see me on my bike. And, you know, people say, oh, it's cheating, it's a throttle bike, you know. In other words, that you, it has an accelerator of some description and you twist the accelerator and there's no need to pedal. There's no physical effort put in on the part of the rider. But it's not actually, that's not my bike. There are throttle bikes out there. Uh, generally, there are two different sorts of bikes. They're the throttle bikes and then there's a bike called a pedal assist, which is what my bike is. So with a pedal assist, you're required to put in a little bit of effort yourself. And when the bike um, figures out that you're putting in some effort, it also gives you a little bit of assistance, hence the name Pedal Assist or Pedelec, you'll, you'll hear them called Pedelecs as well. Okay. Um, there are different sorts of Pedal Assist bikes. There are hub motors um, and then there's like my bike where the motor is on the cranks, yep. where the pedals are. Um, mine, as I said, yeah, mine is a crank motor. Do you see, you've been riding for the last year, is it something that you think you'll continue doing in the years to come? I think so, yeah. I'm really enjoying it and the fact that I've got the electric bike, it just allows me to access terrain that I could probably not access with a regular mountain bike and go further. You know, I have that outdoor lifestyle, I like going camping and, and um, hitting the bush, so that bike allows me to do that and allows me to go further and longer without having to come back to camp. So yes, I'll keep doing that. And what about you, Amin? Do you see yourself riding into the future? Yeah, very much. You want to keep doing it? You're enjoying yeah, it? Yeah, my, my whole life. Excellent. And Java, you've been riding your whole life so far. You mentioned you're pushing your 40s. Is it something you can see yourself continuing doing in I the future as well? I can, yeah. If the body can hold up, <laughs> uh, if it stays the way it, it is, then yeah, for sure, for Excellent. sure. Now, guys, we've brought all these bikes into the studio. I'm, I'm, I'm dying to have a look at some of them. So, look, we'll reconfigure the studio a little bit and have a look at some of these bikes so we can talk about them in more detail. Sounds good. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Now, we've made some room in the studio, gentlemen, and we've brought these excellent machines in, and I'm dying to have a look at them and go from top to bottom. So, Fassel, let's start with the mountain bike you've got here. Yeah. You've got ex extraordinary handlebars on that thing. Can you tell us why they're so wide? Uh, they're wide because the wider the handlebars, the more control you get. Everything on the bike is geared towards control because you know, when you're traveling through the scrub at high speeds, you need the most amount of control in order for you not to fall off your bike. Now, Java, this machine here is completely different. If we look at that, can you talk us a bit about the handlebars on this thing? Yeah, fundamentally designed to go fast, right? So yep. it places you in a aerodynamic position compared to that. So here we have, again, a handlebar coming in different uh, width sizes. You've got what these, these curls here, they call drops. So if you want to, you know, punch it on in relation to speed. Um, you get into that arrow position, holding it there. We also have another position here, just uh, above the braking and gearing system. They normally refer to these as your hoods and then your handles here. So you've got m multiple grip positions, depending on where what and you how need. you're riding. So uphill, you know, you'd probably be here and just punching through speed or on the final. Yep. Uh, you're down here, mate, just punching it through. Okay. Um, you mentioned the brakes and the gearing system. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about these levers compared to the mountain bike? We'll yeah. Get to that in a yeah, so clearly we can see the difference there. With these, these are integrated with gears and braking. So moving them this way will allow you to shift uh, the, through the gearing. There's a lever here also that allows you to shift through and of course your front and rear brakes up here. Okay, when you're pulling them in. And yep. now Fassel on that one, nothing quite so uh, extravagant looking. So how do the brakes and gearing work on this? Uh, look, the brakes on this, um, they are designed to be operated with only one finger. It gives you the most amount of grip on the handlebars. So they're a shorter, stubbier brake lever and there is a brake lever on the right and a brake lever on the left. Obviously, 
one operates the front wheel, one operates the rear wheel. In Australia, we have a certain institution, and in the UK, it's the opposite. In other countries, it may be different. Um, the gearing on this bike, it's not integrated into the brake levers itself. Okay. It's actually underneath the handlebars. Separately controlled. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's separately controlled. It's a cable gear. Um, as I think Jav mentioned in an earlier production, there are other gears out there now. They're electric, electric gears, yep. which um, you change from up here. It sends a signal to the shift down the bottom and they change, right? But this is a cable. So the cable runs all the way down to the gearing system, which is down here. Um, and you press one lever to move to a higher gear and another lever to move to a lower, lower gear. gear. Yeah. Okay. Now, if we move a bit further down the fork there, you've got um, what looks to be like some sort of suspension there on that bike there? Yeah, so this bike has a, susp a suspension fork, excuse me, with a 160 mil of travel. Different bikes, for example, the bike there, that has 120 mils of travel. Okay. So different bikes, different suspension forks. Different uh, have, purposes? Yeah, for different purposes yeah. and have a different amount of travel. Obviously, the more travel, uh, the more extreme terrain you can negotiate without that shock actually bottoming out. Okay. Um, so with this bike here, um, there are there is a lockout on the bicycle because as you, I don't know if you know or not, but if you're using your shocks and they're activated during road riding, it actually takes energy out of okay. your pedal strokes. Yeah, it's just harder, it's, you're working harder basically. Yep. So what you can do if I'm on the road is I just lock the suspension out. So when I press down on it, there, it doesn't travel. Minimum movement. It, it's minimum movement. What sort of movement are you getting without the, the lock on? If I take the lock off, now I'll get yes. the full 160 mil or 16 centimetres of yep. travel. If we move a bit further down, what type of braking system do you have on this mountain bike? Uh, this has got disc brakes on it. I do believe, uh, don't, don't quote me on this, I think they're 180 millimetre rotors. Okay. Obviously, the bigger the rotor, the more braking uh, power you have um, and the more heat dissipation you yep. have. Because you know that's the problem with brakes. The more you brake, the hotter the disc brake, the hotter the disc gets, okay. and you don't want it to. Uh, now, are these cable the operated as well, or are these uh, that's right. different sort of systems? Is it hydraulically operated? No, no, operated? the brakes on this are cable operated too. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Now, Javid, if we look at the fork of this, it looks like it's uh, there's no suspension in here at all. That's right. So <laughs> it's one fixed frame, if you like. This is a carbon fibre bike. It's not my bicycle. Yep. Uh, but you can see the difference in the two triangles. Yep. This is a more aggressive geometry. Yep. Uh, designed specifically for speed. Going fast. That's right. That's right. And you'll see all the tubes. I mean, they've got different names for the top tubes, down tubes, seat tubes, etc. Uh, the names remain the same, but the tubing, the configuration, is slightly changed. different. Yeah. And I noticed that the brakes on this, you don't seem to have any big rotors on nope. this one. These are the traditional rim brakes. Okay. Um, old Tegra system running through. Yep. So literally just hitting on the rim once you press uh, the brakes from mm -hmm. the front or rear. Okay. Now, if we move a bit further down the frame, Fassel, I notice that we've got uh, another sh shock absorber. Is that in the middle of the frame here on this mountain bike? Yeah, this bike is a full suspension bike in okay. that it has a front shock yep. and it also has a rear shock. There are mountain bikes out there that don't have the rear shock and they are often referred to as a hardtail. Okay. Um, so they've just got that one set of front just, suspension. Correct, yeah, they've just got the front suspension. They don't have the rear suspension, uh, hence the terminology hardtail because nothing actually moves. This is all articulated. The whole rear section will move up and down as you're traversing over the trails. Yep. Um, and as you know, the trails aren't like a road. You know, there's dips, there's rocks, there's roots, there's all sorts of hazards out there. And this just makes it uh, easier to negotiate. With this bike, you pretty much jump on it, um, point it, and send it. Yep. And so uh, I do notice it's a little bit different. For those people who haven't seen one of these before, what's that um, big block you've got there on, on one of the tubes? This is an electric bike. So we, we, um, we've spoken about e-bikes before. Um, this is the battery okay. for the mm. e-bike. Down here, this is the crank set down here. So the pedals, crank arm, and the crank arm is actually connected to uh, the, the motor. motor. Yep, All right. The motor. Brilliant. Now, Javid, do you have a similar sort of setup on this? Maybe not the motor, well, yeah, the looks the, of it, or the there battery. Is, there is a very, very strong motor on these, and these yeah. are called your legs. All right, <laughs> All right. so... Uh, got to use your legs. Yeah, that's right. That's pure and simple. Yep. So I notice on this one, we've only seemed to have one chain ring at the front. You've mm -hmm. got a, a couple over here. What's the Again, behind that? Again, built for climbing and also going downhill, but also speed, right? Okay, so speed. you'll see different configurations on the chain ring and the cassette at the rear, yep. uh, designed fundamentally for two different things. So on the cassette there, you notice that, I notice that they're quite small. So which side is the fast end? Of, of right, the so the fast end is go all the way down yep. to the smallest ring in the rear, okay. the largest ring in the front, so literally opposite, Yep. and um, away you go. Yeah, so different configuration options mm. you can get there. But I noticed on this cassette on, on the mountain bike here, Fassel, we've got such a large ring at the back here. 
Yeah. So what's that designed for comparative to say the road bike? So that this is this colloquially known as the granny gear. Um, yep. and, I, and I suggest that that name would give away its purpose. <laughs> it actually makes it easier when you are going uphill. Yeah. Uh, it slows you right down. So it's just using mechanical um, mechanics to basically allow you to get up the hill. Yeah, just a different a gear. Easier. So you're size pedaling faster. Di- size of a dinner plate. It's huge, isn't it? <laughs> it is huge. And and believe me, uh, sometimes on the trails, you, you do need it. And so that's get not it. enough sometimes, eh? Sometimes even, that's not enough. That's even why with the, the motor. Yeah, yeah, you've got the yeah, electrics right. as well. So it all yeah. helps you. It's just all just about climbing on these bikes, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Now, excellent. I think we've, in general, covered what these bikes have to offer. It's a good comparison to see what an e-bike is, or a mountain bike in this case, and, and a road bike carbon frame. So let's get these bikes out of here. We'll get the studio ready again, and we'll, we'll go for it with the rest of the Sounds production. Good. But thanks yeah. very much for talking us through these bikes. No, no know? problems. No problems at all. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, now that was excellent to see the differences in all these bikes that we just had a look at here. Now, Javid, can you tell me a bit about the the changes over these bikes that we saw? Yeah, well, not only the changes we're seeing coming through, but what's ahead of us is, I think, an important question as well, right? So currently what we've seen is uh, changing changes in braking systems, for example. So when I was riding, and you still see them in existence, it's not like they've been taken away from rim braking systems to uh, disc brakes. We've seen the cables being replaced with hydraulic systems. We're seeing chain rings go from the traditional circular shape to the oval shape. We're seeing technology changing in significant ways. For example, the bike computers that you can use. Um, I have one here. Um, so this, this is handy for so many things, including data collection. We've got social fitness apps available out there also that help you collect the data, assess yourself. So you don't have to be competing you know, in the grand tours, etc. Um, and the question is, what's ahead of us also? So there's a lot of research and development in this space. Um, and I suppose keep an eye yeah. on this space. So it was interesting to see the difference between a mountain bike that's 10 to 15 years old that we saw versus mm. what we're seeing upcoming in these mountain bikes that are only mm. a year old. Plus mm. you mentioned the future, Will. I mean, it looks like e-bikes are going to be taking off much as there was some interesting statistics, Fassel, that you were mentioning from, from Europe. Do you mind sharing some of those with us? Yeah, I won't um, quote direct numbers um, because, as you know, statistics you have a habit vary. of changing all the time. But apparently, from what I've read in Europe, a large portion of bikes that are now being sold or bought uh, are actually e-bikes. It's a significant quantity. It, it is. The, the numbers I was reading were, were very high, very high indeed. Uh, it's, very, it's surprising. And that's now starting to sort of uh, overflow into Australia, um, into the States, as I am led to believe as well. Um, so I think that... There's a definite trend, a shift in trend from purchases from the traditional mountain bike more to e-biking, whether it's e-biking for mountain biking or, or road biking here well, as well. Well, it, it really, if you look at it, it's a great equaliser. You can have a person who is older in age, you know, you're talking about, I'm talking about people in their um, 60s and 70s now uh, jumping back on bicycles because they can keep up with younger people who are riding. You know, so everyone can ride in a group and everyone can ride together. These bikes are allowing more people to get onto bikes and more people to ride, which I think is a win-win for everybody. Yeah, you know, it it's, it's definitely, it's, it's a good thing. Um, so as I said earlier, they are the great equalizer. Those people who don't have um, high levels of fitness, you know, it allows them to build their fitness and it allows them to, again, ride in that group, that social environment. As we know, when you ride in a group, you feel a little bit more motivated to keep riding. You do, yep. you do. Now, we're talking about these um, road riders. Javed, you know, I've heard this acronym, uh, MAMIL, M-A-M-I-L. Do you, do you want to yeah, share that? Middle-aged men in Lycra. Uh, okay. Look, in the old days, it was mildly offensive from the public's perspective to turn up, say, in the local cafe with Lycra on. And for the person wearing it, it was, you know, a bit uncomfortable, let's face the facts. But, you know, the past 10 years with the advent of Team Sky and the Grand Tours, they've sort of cracked that and made it more socially acceptable. They've made it fashionable. And people are getting out there in their groups, like you just said, Fassel, for so many reasons, not just to compete against each other. I think it's gone beyond that. It's about one's fitness, one's mental health, that camaraderie that you build. After a ride, you go back, you know, have your snacks or carb up, you know, and, and talk about the ride and you feel you feel a sense of achievement. That's it's, there's no doubt about it's that. It's the group focus in those road riding situations. You, you mentioned the, the mental health. That's it's extraordinary to see just riding with people of, of a like mind to you um, increases your mental health. Well that's that's exactly right. Like any other team sport where it allows you to free yourself up, whether it's football, soccer, cricket, etc. Cycling is now becoming mainstream. 
more affordable, one could say, because you've got them in a vast space of um, how, how, how much you want to spend on bikes. You know, so you don't have to go it's, buy. It's the interesting top of the you line. mentioned you mentioned price here. So, what would you say is an entry level price on some of these bikes? Not maybe not the ones that we've seen, but if someone was just to start riding, you know, are we talking hundreds, thousands of dollars? You can get a decent bike in a thousand Australian dollars. Yep. Um, because you is don't it, need the. Is that something that you would you would buy a, a kid? Or how? What are we talking? No, not necessarily. Um, adults. Um, my my bike, for example. Uh, was I bought mine for three thousand dollars, but yep. there were similar bikes uh, f available for about twelve hundred dollars, and that that does it. That's enough, yeah. you know. Unless you're competing, then you're looking at uh, bikes valued at twelve, fifteen thousand, and so on and so forth. It's amazing. So you can see bikes even ranging from the two hundred dollar mark. To, it's very affordable for entry level bikes for anyone looking to get into the industry, don't you think, Fessel? Look, I think that's probably the best way to go because then you can, you get some sort of idea of what you're in store for, okay? But you shouldn't base your experience on that uh, entry level bike because as, I, as, as been said earlier on, as you start paying more money for a bike, it starts becoming a better experience to ride that bike. Yep. But certainly to get a feel for cycling, uh, to figure out what it's all about and to figure out if indeed it is the sport for you, uh, certainly, start at entry level, you know, and if you do enjoy it, then just you can, you can go anywhere from there. Yeah, you know? I think so. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Now, I mean, whereabouts do you do most of your riding? Um, in the bush, in rough terrains, on the road, on the paths, practically anywhere. Anywhere you can ride. Yeah. Yeah, on footpaths, on on the on the shoulders of the roads. That's yeah. Very good. And Javid, you're a road rider, so whereabouts do you find yourself doing most of your riding? Yeah, good question. I try to avoid the main roads, to be honest with you, simply because of safety. So where we live, it's semi-rural, so it gives me an opportunity to uh, ride down the farmland roads. Yeah, they can be deceptively dangerous, but um, you know, I try to manage my risk by doing various things. Bike paths in Sydney, you'll find that... They're on the rise. Oh, they are, they certainly are, so it's fantastic. Now, when yeah. people say bike path, uh, are they talking about uh, one that's on the road, shared with the road? Are you slightly separate from traffic? Well, all of the above, really. So you can get uh, bike paths that are totally separated from the road or run parallel with a road with a buffer in between or on the medium strip there or on, on the side side of the road. Just that bit of a safety feature yeah. really to stop you yeah. riding in traffic. Yeah, and the laws now have been toughened also that you've got to leave minimum distances from cyclists, etc. So that's excellent to see the, the changes that are supporting the, the, the effort from councils and governments to get more people into cycling. Now you mentioned these bike paths. I've noticed that in my area, you know, you can cycle from McGrath Hill all the way to the city, which is almost 50 kilometres on, on yeah. dedicated it's bike paths almost, yeah. right? Without having to share with the road at all. So it's much more safe. Now, Fassel, you mentioned you're getting into mountain biking. What can mountain bikers do? Uh, is, is their places easily accessible for us? Yeah, absolutely. Look, f for my purposes personally, I wanted a bike that will do pretty much everything because I ride to work from time to time. So I'll use the bike paths, as Javid mentioned earlier on. Um, and I also enjoy getting out there and riding the trails. And the electric bike allows me to do both, okay? Um, yeah, in, in Sydney itself, there are many tracks that people have made through bushland. Um, keen mountain bikers have just gotten out there and started making their own tracks. And they're accessible to anybody. There are also officially sanctioned council tracks, which have been made by people who specifically design mountain bike tracks. And, that, and, and when I say specifically design, it's not just a matter of finding a dirt road and riding around on the dirt road. There are specific obstacles, you know, which mountain bikers enjoy negotiating. For example, jumps uh, and drop-offs, things like that, which add a little bit of a challenge to the whole mountain bike experience, you know. And, and they, that's what makes it distinct from actually riding on the road and finding a straight line and just riding. Yeah, it's you know? interesting, someone who might live in a built-up area might not think that that sort of uh, park is, you know, accessible without having to drive out of Sydney for a few hours. They exist. But they exist. They exist. They're yeah, I've absolutely. noticed that there's one in, in Western Sydney, which is literally 40 minutes from pretty much anywhere you live in Sydney. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's not far at all. It, it's not that far. Easily accessible by everybody. The council maintains it, so it's very well maintained all the time. Uh, one of the fellows who is actually instrumental in designing that track was telling me the other day that um, they're actually redoing it. They're they're going to revamp the whole track 
to make it a better experience. Yeah, so they keep keep changing things up, making them interesting. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and outside of Sydney, of course, we've got places like Threadbow that during uh, the summer months open up to mountain bikers. Tasmania now has become, it's on the map now in relation to mountain biking. Awesome switchbacks, awesome trails that just follow through. And yeah, it was a town that was, you know, dying really and, and cycling has brought it back to life. Well, the, see, the beauty is that there are different sorts of mountain biking based on, you know, where you want to go and what you want to do. There's technical riding, there's downhill flow, which is um, down near Threadbow and things like that. When you, know, you just jump on a trail and you're just riding down a, a mountain bike trail for kilometres on end. It's just a nice, smooth experience. And you get back up, jump on an electric bike all the way up yeah, and right. then back down. How yeah. awesome is that? It that's is. Excellent. Yeah. It is awesome. Now, there's also some safety concerns that you can also have while riding mountain bike trails. I know that I had an experience recently where out in the middle of nowhere in Sydney, you've got no phone reception, barely any GPS reception, that uh, you can get turned around in these state forests and not know where you are. It was just lucky that I happened to be able to work out how to get back home off that. Now, is that something that people should be concerned about? What are some of the options that they can do to sort of combat that? Um... Look, I think um, this is a wider issue than just mountain biking. I think anybody who ventures into uh, off-road areas, certainly into the, we call it the bush in Australia, uh, going off-road, I think anybody who ventures into those areas, whether you're walking or riding, needs to have some idea of what they're doing. They need to be able to navigate themselves. They need Maps are very important. If you don't know how to use a compass, at least have some sort of GPS. I wouldn't advise that as your primary device, but um, you know, it's better than having nothing at all and getting out there and then getting lost. So, Jarvis, you also had that uh, bike computer there that yeah. can track you and trip your ride. Uh, I'm assuming yeah. that can trip, track your ride and, and get you back home as That's well? That's right. That's right. They can. And, um, you know, technology has advanced so much that this this unit here can uh, record your ride, bring you back, just like your navigation system in a vehicle. We've got our smart watches. Uh, we've got the Emergency Plus app designed by the government that, you know, with or without reception, it'll, it'll get you some help. Or you can do the old Top Gear trick with the brittling watch and activate it for assistance. Um, but of course, that's far above and beyond. Now, but like Fassel said, totally agree. You've got to uh, uh, do your homework, understand where you're going, and what's your plan B, C and D, I reckon? You need to probably also just to build upon that, let somebody know where you're going. Yeah, that's an excellent and let them know when you've hit the trail, when you're coming off the trail. This is important information so people can keep a track of where you are. And you know, if you don't report in over a certain time, they can then take matters further if they need to. Mm. Can I extend on that whole safety thing? I mean, with, living in Australia, in Sydney, you know, you've got the threat of bushfires. We've got our eco hazards like snakes and spiders. I mean, we don't want to sound alarmist, but these things exist and it'll be naive to think that these things don't. I mean, we've had people... You should take adequate precautions if you're going yeah, mountain well, biking that's, in that's rural areas. I think in, in, in any, even on the road, you should be taking correct precautions, you know? So. Oh, my word. And, and the safety gear that Amun was talking about before, um, that's necessary. Don't, it's not a good idea to just get out there, you know, and um, just ride the trails without yeah, helmets. Tongs and shorts and Yeah, no that's helmets. right. Well, that's exactly here, right. I mean, got caught without your PPE. What happened to you? Uh, long story short, but uh, I was going down a hill and I skidded and there wasn't any hand grip and the metal p part of the bar went up here. Ooh. And um, now my dad calls me Iron Man. Because <laughs> it, it leaves a big circle here. Wow. Yeah. But as a result, I've bought um, a chest plate for him, uh, available from uh, motorbike shops. Yep. I found it difficult to find them from you know the traditional bicycle shops, and um, so, so in a sense, correct equipment, personal protection, yeah. uh, riding, taking the correct precautions is all something that mm. people should be doing. Absolutely, but also food and water. Yep. Very important, especially if you're going off the beaten track. I think you need to take some yeah, food point. and, yeah, and it, you know, just water. replenish energy because riding takes it out of you. You may not so, think so, yep. and it'll hit you. It, you won't even realise it's going to hit you, and it'll hit you. So make yes. sure you take adequate provisions. All right. Thank you very much for joining us in today's program. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. I hope we were able to illustrate some of the options available to you if you want to get into cycling. Whether it's mountain biking, e-biking, or road biking, cycling is a sport for all ages. And if current trends continue, it'll be easier for you to cycle and commute from suburb to suburb on safe tracks. I encourage anyone who is considering getting back into the sport to head down to your local bike shop and test ride some bikes or e-bikes on test days and ride days. These are usually free and you can get a feel for the sport before you commit any money. Thanks very much for watching and we look forward to bringing you another episode of Informate from MTA International, Australia Studios. Jazakmullah and Khudafiz.